Ah, now it is live, sir. Okay. Okay. So can we start? Yeah, please do start. Yeah, yeah. Very uh, good afternoon to one and all present here. Uh, uh, Lakshmi, Lakshmi, they keep record also. Yeah, Lakshmi, yeah. Ro Rohini, uh, if possible, please keep record. Yeah. yeah, on behalf of South Asian Meteorological Association and uh, SRM Institute of Science and Technology, so I welcome all the uh, panelists as well as the participants for the uh, 14th lecture of the 16th, uh, 16 lecture series on open classroom online lecture series on climate, atmospheric and climate sciences. So today uh, we are going to have the second lecture on cloud physics, that is on cloud microphysics. So the speaker is uh, Dr. Professor P. Pradeep Kumar, uh, Professor uh, Savitri Bhai Pule, Pune University, India. So on this occasion, I also welcome uh, Professor uh, AVM, uh, Professor Ajit Tyagi, President South Asian Metrology Association, Dr. Rohini, uh, Pune University, uh, India, and Dr. Mohan Das, uh, uh, Executive Director, uh, Naomi, and also Joint Secretary for South Asian Metrology Association. So now, uh, with this, I request Professor Pradeep, Pradeep Kumar uh, to give his talk. Sir, over to you, sir. Okay. Yeah, it's, is the screen visible now? Yes, sir. Fine, fine. Okay. Yes, sir. Perfect. Let me recap my lecture one before I get to the lecture two. In the lecture one, the, I'd said that a cloud is a visible aggregate of uh, small water droplets and or ice crystals suspended in the atmosphere. Clouds are classified on the basis of height and shapes they take. There are four fundamental mechanisms through which clouds can form in the atmosphere. Phase changes of water play a major role in the formation of droplets and ice crystals in the cloud. Droplet formation by homogeneous nucleation of water vapor condensation is not favored in subsaturated air as the energy of the system increases. In subsaturated air, even for a small embryonic droplet to form by homogeneous nucleation of water vapor condensation, the supersaturation or the relative humidity required are very large and such high supersaturations are not observed in the atmosphere. In heterogeneous nucleation, the vapor pressure over the droplet is lowered drastically due to the presence of the solute. This lowering of vapor pressure can help the uh, droplet formation at supersaturations or relative humidity which are found in natural clouds. Polar equation or the Kohler curve gives the critical supersaturation required for a droplet nucleation for a given dry size or a given mass of the solute. Solute is nothing but the CCN. And Kohler equation also gives the critical radius of the droplet when it is activated as a cloud droplet. This was a recap of my first lecture. Now let us get to the second part. So cloud condensation nuclei. Is there a small part of aerosols which serve as particles upon which water condenses and cloud droplets are formed. In general, larger the size of the particle, the more readily it will be wetted by water and greater will be the solubility of the particle. The lower will be the saturation at which the particle can serve as a CCN. Now, completely wettable but soluble particle needs to be at least or insoluble particles needs to be at least 0.1 micron in radius at 1% supersaturation to serve as a CCN. But soluble particles of size 0.01 micron can serve as CCN at the same supersaturation. And in general, most of the CCN 
consists of a mixture of soluble, insoluble particles. They are either internally mixed or externally mixed, all kinds of combinations you get in the atmosphere. Now, CCN measurements are made by an apparatus called as a thermal gradient diffusion chain. Now, the principle here is to keep two plates saturated with water. And by varying the temperature difference between the two plates, it is possible to change the supersaturation in the chamber. And these plates are either kept in a horizontal configuration or in a vertical configuration. Now, the horizontal configuration I will describe. It is an instrument which was made by myself at the University of Toronto. And uh, these are the two plates here, the upper plate and the lower plate. The lower plate is kept at a colder temperature compared to the upper plate. And this is the actual uh, instrument which you're seeing. This is the uh, two plates. And uh, these are kept wet. These are kept wet by uh, filter paper. And these are kept moist. And this is the sealed one. Once you seal it, and then you vary the, uh, you put the bottom temper plate at a different temperature, which is colder than the warmer plate at the top. And the supersaturations inside the chamber, when you're starting from the top plate to the bottom plate, will be the pro profile inside will be like this, which is almost seeing a maximum supersaturation at the center of the chamber. These are two different kind of three, four supersaturations which I have plotted. So as you vary the temperatures, the shape of the supersaturation curve inside the chamber will vary. So the idea here is to bring in the aerosols from outside. And it has to see the center of the chamber because that is where the maximum supersaturation is there. So therefore, you, you squeeze it to the center by flowing in particle-free air towards the boundary of this chamber particle free air or in sometimes we, we used actually nitrogen, which is an inert gas. And then you try to squeeze this uh, aerosols which are coming from outside into the center of the chamber. And the whole, when you close this chamber, the in, inner free space is only 13 millimeters. Okay. And the saturation inside the chamber, you can calculate from your clashes clapeyron equation at different points. This is the equation which I had dealt in the previous class also. As the temperature is varying, you can get your supersaturations inside the chamber. So as the temperature will be linearly varying, you will get a, a curve like this. So this is the apparatus in a laboratory configuration, which can be later taken to the field configuration. Now, how you are calibrating this chamber? This chamber you calibrate it by bringing in some test aerosols. Here the test aerosols, you can use ammonium sulfate. I'm giving you a figure of an ammonium sulfate which is used as a test aerosol. The dry, these are the dry particle diameters. And this uh, y-axis gives you the actually the percentage of the ammonium sulfate particle, which is activated as a cloud drop. So you keep varying the, this is at two curves. One is at supersaturation, center supersaturation maintained at 0.3%. And this is the another graph, which is the center saturation supersaturation maintained at 0.67%. So you bring different sizes of aerosols and you look at the activation fraction here. And the experimental activation diameter, you see when 50% of the particles have activated as a cloud droplet, then you take it as an experimental kohler diameter. And this experimental kohler diameter should be equal to the theoretical kohler diameter, which I have told you in the first lecture for that given supersaturation, then you can say that your chamber is perfectly working fine. And this is when a figure of how in that small distance of 30 centimeters, when you're putting in an ammonium sulfate particles of 140 nanometers, you at a supersaturation of 0.33%. When it is exiting out of this length of this chamber, it would have activated as a cloud droplets going to around varying from 1 to 5 micron in diameter. The spread is there because there will be slight spread because you cannot exactly squeeze to the center. And there will also be a spread in the slight spread in the size of the aerosols which we are sending in, ammonium sulfate particles. 
So once this is done, you know that your chamber is working fine. And then you have the vertical configurations. This is again the vertical configuration where the aerosol flow is brought in again to see the center and you have the plates kept at two different temperatures. And this is a typical configuration of the one which is commercially available from 2005. The CCN counters are, com are commercially available from DMT Incorporation. This is the basically where there are different sections, they are varying the temperature. And then they are, so this is the vertical configuration. So CCN counters are operated either in the horizontal mode or in the vertical mode. So mostly till 2005, people used to make their own CCN counters for measuring the CCNs. Now data from cloud chamber measurements from these uh, CCN counters are often parameterized in this following form, where NC is the number of particles per unit volume that are activated to become cloud droplets at supersaturation S. And C and K are the parameters that depend upon the air mass type and come from your observation. So this chamber, you take it out to the field, you carry out your observations and you can get your the number of activated uh, CCNs in this form, which you can run it into your, put it into your numerical models for running it. So generally in a maritime air, this C varies from 30 to 300 per centimeter cube and K varies from 0.3 to one. And continental air, it is higher. It varies from 300 to 3000 and K varies from 0.2 to 0.2. So for a same supersaturation ratio, Numbers of CCN per unit volume in a maritime air are small and large numbers per unit volume in a continental air. So concentrations of CCN over land decline by a factor of about five between a planetary boundary layer and a free troposphere, whereas over the ocean, it may remain fairly constant or may even increase with height. These are from the observations. So now if you look at the particle sizes inside a cloud, your CCNs are typically uh, 0.1 micron. The number of CCNs will be about 10 to the power of six per liter. A typical cloud droplet in a cloud can be 10 micron with a number again, 10 to the power of six per liter. A large cloud droplet with around 50 micron size, we call it as a large cloud droplet. The number is about 10 to the power of three per liter. These are approximate numbers. And a typical raindrop, 1000 micron, one millimeter, it will be typically about one per liter. So from a CCN, which is 10 to the power of six, to a typical cloud droplet, which is again 10 to the power of six per liter, the typical raindrop is about one per liter. So now let us look at the growth of uh, cloud droplets in a warm cloud, how it is happening. So this was a Kohler curve, which I described to you in the first, my first lecture. So if the drop has crossed the peak of the Kohler curve, it is activated as a cloud droplet and it can continue to grow by water vapor condensing on it, provided the ambient supersaturation or the ambient vapor pressure is exceeding the vapor pressure of that of exerted by the drop. Only then it will continue to grow as a by condensation process. So now consider an isolated droplet. We take a single droplet with a radius R at a time T situated in a supersaturated environment. So if the system is in a steady state equilibrium, the rate of increase in mass M of the droplet at time T is equal to the rate of flow of water vapor across a normal to a in unit area of this droplet in the presence of a gradient of water vapor density. So there is a gradient of water vapor density which is towards the drop and the, it is, the water vapor is flowing and it can continue to grow. So the rate of increase in mass of mass of the droplet is given by this dm by dt, 4 pi x square, x again, it is a distance. D is a diffusion coefficient, water vapor diffusion coefficient, and rho w is the density of water vapor. So where rho w is the density of water vapor at a distance x, which will be greater than the radius of the droplet. x 
greater than the radius of the droplet and d is the water vapor diffusion coefficient so this equation i can integrate it from x is equal to r to x is equal to infinity where my water vapor density at x is equal to r is rho v r and at a large distance away from the drop is rho v infinity so rho v r is adjacent to the drop and rho v infinity is adjacent to i'll integrate this equation and i'll get dm by dt is equal to 4 pi r d this is the difference between the water vapor densities and i can put for m i can put 4 pi 4 pi r cube rho l where rho l is my density of the liquid water so if i put that then i will get this dr by dt is equal to d upon r rho l into this form so now using the ideal gas flow i can modify this equation and get instead of rho v and rho r i get it in terms of vapor pressure so i get it in now in terms of vapor pressure by using the ideal gas equation where my e infinity is the water vapor pressure of the ambient air well away from the droplet and er is the water vapor pressure adjacent to the droplet which is approximately equal to the saturation vapor pressure es which you can get from your clausius clapeyron equation so if e infinity is not very different from es then i can modify this this equation this uh, e infinity minus er upon e infinity to this and call it as the super saturation of the ambient air it will be approximately equal to the super saturation of the ambient air so equation 10 i have replaced this with super saturation of the ambient air so that will become now r dr by dt is equal to gl into s where gl is the diffusion coefficient rho v infinity upon density of liquid water this can be considered as a constant for a given environment at any given fixed temperature so this equation if you see now it is dr by dt is inversely proportional to r dr by dt is proportional to 1 by r which means that as the drop is growing bigger and bigger it is it becomes the growth rate diminishes so initially the growth rate will be very very fast but then as the drop is growing bigger and bigger as this is bigger and bigger this dr by dt will be slowing down so the growth rate of the drops will slow down so this shows that is droplets which are growing by only by water vapor condensation it will increase in radius very rapidly but their growth time diminishes with time now if you look at um, i'm just showing you an example which is uh, calculated by mason in 1971 if you look at a drop which is uh, activated as a cloud droplet and it has started at an initial radius of 0.75 micron so for that to grow to 5 micron it takes about 17 minutes and for the same drop to grow to 10 micron it takes about 45 minutes for the same droplet to grow to a large cloud droplet of 50 micron it takes about 12 and a half hours so what does that mean it means that the growth by condensation is a very very slow process to give you a to give you a rain drop so as the cloud rises and expands the super saturation in the cloud also rises because as it is expanding the super saturation will be increasing and when it is going up then the ccns which are most efficient they will be activating first and so but when they are activating and growing as a cloud cloud droplet by condensation process they consume water vapor faster than what is made available by the cooling of the air so therefore the super saturation begins to decrease but then when the super saturation is begin to decrease and the haze droplets 
which can no longer be existing at that super saturation they will begin to evaporate and while the activated droplets will continue to grow so the haze droplets which are evaporating again will give you the vapor pressure which will give the vapor pressure for the activated droplets to continue to grow by condensation process so because the rate of growth the dr by dt is is inversely proportional to r the smaller activated droplets will grow faster than the larger ones and the larger ones will slow down with time so consequently when this growth by condensation process happens the the droplet concentration will approach a mono dispersed distribution so the distribution will not be very wide it will be more or less centered around a, a single droplet radius so this is what happens if the droplet is growing only by the condensation process the the more efficient ccns will activate first so they will start growing but when they start growing they cross this is the this is the curve which it follows so they will start slowing with time so as they start slowing with time then the smaller ones which are there they will be growing fast so ultimately the entire droplet population in the cloud will have a mono dispersed distribution so it will not grow any further so for a cloud droplet of 10 micron radius to grow to a rain drop size of 1 mm in radius requires an increase in volume in a volume of nearly 1 million fold however only one cloud droplet in a million drops that is only one drop out of 10 to the power of 6 cloud droplets in a cloud has to grow to produce a rain drop because if when i showed you the distribution the number densities or number concentrations in a cloud your ccn was of the order of 10 to the power of 6 per liter your cloud droplet of 10 micron radius was about 10 to the power of 6 per liter but the rain drop was only 1 per liter so from a cloud drop to reach to a rain drop only one drop has to grow to reach a rain drop size one cloud drop which is activated has to reach to a rain drop size so we look at how the in warm clouds the growth of droplets can happen so in a warm clouds the growth of cloud droplets from relatively small size which is achieved by condensation process to the size of rain drops can happen through the process of collection by the collision and coalescence mechanism now let us consider a single drop of radius r1 which is overtaking a small droplet of radius r2 now as the collector drop is approaching the smaller droplets that smaller droplet can follow a streamline which are set up by this drops and can avoid a capture so the effective collision cross section for a droplet of radius r2 is pi y square where y is the critical distance between the center fall line of this small droplet and this collector so if the center if is closer of the droplet is closer than y then the collision can happen so the geometrical cross section is pi into r1 plus r2 whole square so we have a collision efficiency of the droplets of r2 with the drop of radius r1 which is about the which is the this one the um, collision cross section divided by the geometrical cross section so when the collector drops are much larger than the droplets when this r2 upon r1 is much less than 1 then the collision efficiencies are small as the droplets tend to follow the streamlines and around the collector droplet and avoid a capture and as r2 upon r1 increases e initially increases because the larger droplets tend to move in a nearly straight line rather than streamlines around the collector droplet and e can then later fall off for smaller collector droplets when the terminal velocities of the two drops are approaching each other so 
when the terminal velocities are uh, of the two droplets as the uh, the collector drop and the small small droplet cloud droplets when they are nearly approaching each other then again the collision ef efficiency can fall off now next to see is whether a drop is captured whether coalescences can happen generally when these two droplets are approaching each other there is a cushion of air which comes in between and this cushion of air you can see even if you put a plain water surface and if you put a drop of uh, if you start dropping with a dropper water drops then you will see that these drops bounce off without actually making physical contact with the water surface so such a thing happens even in the atmosphere that droplets which are they may not actually physically contact each other so droplets can rebound from this cushion of air it is only if the cushion of air is squeezed off then a physical contact is made and the coil the drop can this small drop can coalesce with the bigger drop but even after the two droplets have coalesced the the motions which are set up in by the combined mass they may subsequently make the droplet to be instable and can break up into several drop smaller droplets again so we look at a small uh, a model where we try to explain the growth by a of the droplet through a continuous collection model now we take r1 as a collected drop and r2 are evenly distributed uniformly distributed small cloud droplets of size r2 and this r2 has got a velocity v2 and the collected drop is falling through a has got a terminal velocity of v1 now assume that these all these are distributed uniformly in space and this collected drop is collecting all these droplets at the same rate of all the droplets of the same size so the rate of increase of mass m of the collected drop due to the collisions is given by dm by dt is equal to pi r1 square difference between the terminal velocities of the two droplets l is the liquid water content liquid water content of all these small droplets if you add them together what is the liquid water content of that droplet in kg per meter cube and ec is the collection efficiency now we can put m here as 4 by 3 pi r cube into rho l where rho l is the density of the liquid water and so we get dr1 by dt is the difference between the terminal velocities of the collected drop in the small droplet l is your liquid water content e is the collection efficiency and rho l is the density of the liquid water now if the velocity of the collector drop is more than that of the smaller crowd droplets if we say that v1 is much larger than v2 and we also assume that collection efficiency ec is equal to the collision efficiency e then this equation will become dr1 by dt is equal to v1 le upon 4 rho l so this is my equation 15 dr1 by dt is v1 l is the liquid water content e is my collision efficiency rho l is the density of liquid water content now your v1 which is the terminal velocity will increase with r1 as r1 increases v1 increases and e also increases with r1 so therefore it follows that dr1 by dt increases with increasing r1 whereas in a condensed this is by the collision through the collision coalescence process and in the growth by condensation process you had dr by dt was inversely proportional to r so this was the growth by condensation process and the curve which is the growth by collision coalescence process will be an accelerating curve so initially the growth by condensation process will dominate and after some time beyond a certain radius it is the growth by collision coalescence process that will dominate so this crossover radius is approximately close to about 20 micron that depends from 
cloud to cloud or so in this we can take it only as an approximate value of 20 mic. So now let us look at, so now you have a initially a growth by condensation process after the CCN is activated and it has crossed the Kohler curve or the peak of the Kohler curve, it is activated as a cloud droplet, it is beginning to grow by condensation process and at certain point of time, the growth by collision coalescence process dominates and then it is an accelerating process and it will try to produce the rain drop size. So if you look at the initiation of a rain in a warm clouds, let me, this is an example which I am going to discuss. So if there is a steady updraft velocity W in the cloud, the velocity of the collector droplet will be W minus V1 and the velocity of the small cloud droplet will be W minus V2. So the motion of the collected drop is given by dh by dt is equal to w minus v1. And now I eliminate dt, this time term I eliminate between equations 15 and 16. So this 15 was my dr1 by dt, this was the equation 15. So from between this, if I eliminate, then I get the variation of my collector drop with height h. This is V1 is the terminal velocity of the collector drop. L is the liquid water content in the cloud of the small droplets. E is my collision efficiency. W is my updraft velocity. Rho L is the liquid water content. So if I now integrate this equation from a height 0, now my height 0 will be the cloud base and to a height h inside the cloud. And R0 is the radius of the cloud collector drop at the cloud base and Rh is the radius of the collector drop at a height h. So this is, I have, this I have brought it from this equation. Now if I, I'm assuming that the liquid water is content as independent of height and this, this, I get this as H, which is the motion of my collected drop as one, this integral minus this integral. Okay. Now, when the drop is quite small, that is when my updraft velocity is much greater than my, the terminal velocity of the collected drop, then this integral will dominate. H increases as the size of the collected drop increases. So a growing drop is carried upward in the cloud. Subsequently, as the drop continues to grow, my V1 will become greater than the updraft velocity W, then this integral will dominate over the first integral. And therefore, this height where the drop is, it will continue to decrease and H will decrease with increasing RH, which is the radius of the collector drop and the drop will begin to fall through the updraft. It will eventually cross the cloud base and fall down as a rain drop. So this is a very simple model to explain how the rain is forming through the collision coalescence mechanism. Now when the rain falls out from the cloud, it will be evaporating because inside the cloud, the supersaturation is different. And as it comes out of the cloud, the, super, the clouds may, the air around below it may not be supersaturated, it may be subsaturated. So as it is falling out, it will be evaporating. And sometimes you find that the rain has the cloud is precipitated, but it doesn't reach the ground. So such a phenomenon is called as the virga. Virga is a precipitation which falls from the cloud, but evaporates before it reaches the ground. So it is as the cloud droplets are falling out of the cloud, it will evaporate. And this is a typical example of a 
when we are taking an isothermal atmosphere of 280 degree Kelvin and a saturation ratio of 0.8, that is about 80% relative humidity, then the distance the drop falls before it is evaporating, it will, this is given. So in this situation, a 150 micron drop before it evaporates, it can, it will travel about 1.5 kilometer, a 100 micron drop can travel only about 208 meter because before it completely evaporates. So evaporation is happening of a, of a raindrop when it is falling out of the cloud. So, so the drops which have started from the cloud at whatever size by the time it reaches the ground, the size would have varied. It, is, it may not be the same size from which it has fallen out of the cloud by the time it hits the ground. Now, other factors which are influencing the growth of the droplets. Turbulence. Turbulence can, it can influence the growth of the droplets by fluctuating the supersaturations, by producing fluctuating supersaturations that enhance condensational growth and also enhance collision efficiencies and collection. Then entrainment. There will be always outside air entraining into the cloud. And such an entrainment when it is happening, especially when it is happening from the top of the cloud, it will cause, so when a subsaturated air is entraining into the cloud, then it will cause the evaporation of the cloud water. So when the cloud water is evaporated, it will cool, that particular pocket of air will cool and that will sink and it will develop a downdraft. And when such a thing happens, it can cause patchiness in the distribution of liquid water content and this will tend to broaden the drop size distribution. And broadening of a drop size distribution is very, very important for the clouds to grow by the collision coalescence process. because. Remember, if the drops are all of the same size and if they are all of the same terminal velocity, then collisions cannot happen. So for a collision collision, for an efficient collision collision process to happen, it requires a, a broad drop size spectrum. So this entrainment can cause a broaden the drop size distribution. The next <coughs> things which can influence is the vorticity. Regions of high vorticity will experience high supersaturation and therefore controls the droplet growth by condensation process. This can also lead to the broadening of the droplet spectrum. Now remember one thing because even when the collision coalescence processes are happening, the condensed growth by condensation process also will be happening. That doesn't just stop. That is also a process which will be continuing. So. Uh, the, this one is the models, modelers when they try to explain the, uh, because you have to achieve the raindrop in a reasonable time. Because if you look at only by the growth by condensation process, it will take forever for the raindrop to form. Because rain, from a cloud droplet of 10 micron size to reach to a one millimeter size, it is an enormous increase in volume. So condensation is a very slow process. So there is, the growth by a statistical models, they express the growth of a cloud droplet in terms of a probability that a large drop will collect another drop of any smaller size. Though, so they try to express in terms of a probability function of the growth of a larger drop. And in this approach, the collision efficiencies is the probability that a droplet of radius r will collect a droplet of radius small r located in a random position in a given volume of space. And so they use this probability function to express this collection process. And the rate of increase of mass dm by dt using such stochastic collection model is described in terms of the temporal evolution of the droplet size using a distribution function. And using such models, the raindrops in a cloud can be produced in about 15 minutes. So then there are, there are several models, but here I have given you only the very basic 
a simple mechanism to understand the rain formation process. So, what is my the take home message from today's lecture is that CCN measurements are done in the atmosphere using thermal gradient diffusion chambers. And from these measurements, you can parameterize it and use it in numerical weather models. And for the generally seen that for the same supersaturation ratio or the saturation ratio, the number of CCNs per unit volume in a maritime air are very small and compared to large numbers per unit volume which are seen in the cotton continental air at the same supersaturation. In the growth by condensation process, the growth of droplets is inversely proportional to the radius of the drop and the droplet concentration will therefore reach a monodispersed population and growth by condensation is too slow a process to produce rain in natural clouds. And in warm clouds, the growth of droplets from relatively small size, which is achieved by condensation to the size of raindrops can happen through the process of collection by collision and coalescence mechanisms. Factors such as turbulence, entrainment and vorticity contribute to the broadening of the droplet spectrum, which enhances the collision coalescence mechanism. And your stochastic collection model can produce rain in 15 minutes. So again, this is a very, very vast subject because when you get into actual numerical modeling of the, uh, the precipitation process, this is only very basic. So many other factors have to be taken into account because it is a crowd, is a, it is a very dynamic process which is happening. So many things are changing simultaneously. So numerical modeling is a very tough problem of the rain formation process. So these are the references which are there for this lecture. So I can take questions. Thank you, sir. I think uh, participants need some time to type the questions because. Next question, can you hear me? Next question, can you hear me? Dr. Rohini, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. So, there are still uh, no questions, so we are waiting for the participants to come. Okay. Uh, sir, can I ask you one question? Maybe it is a uh, little uh, uh, different. Uh, can you hear me, sir? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Uh, yeah. Uh, see, I think uh, uh, for a cloud droplet uh, of, let us suppose, uh, 10 square micron size to form in the atmosphere, I read that it takes around uh, uh, seven days. Uh, is By it, condensation process. Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, is it uh, connected to the residence time of the moisture in the atmosphere? Because no. we, we talk uh, residence no. time of the water in the atmosphere is around 10 days in the troposphere also. No, it is not to do with the residence time of the moisture. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, Rohini, it seems there are no questions from the participants. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, th thank you, sir, uh, for this lecture. Uh, now I request uh, Dr. Mohan uh, uh, to give you a word of thanks. Before that, I think we can have a group photograph. So uh, can you, can you stop there? I'll start sharing. Just stop sharing. Yeah. You want to share, Mohan? Yeah. Yeah, it's just, just a minute. Is, is the slide visible? Yes, yes. Perfect. Okay. Uh, dear esteemed research persons, uh, coordinator, and uh, participants, it is my honor and a pleasure to express my sincere gratitude for the successful completion of today's international lecture series session on cloud physics, processes of cloud formation. Uh, on behalf of SAMA, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to our esteemed speaker, Dr. P. Pradeep Kumar, Professor Shabitri Bhai. Just a minute, I made a mistake. Okay, okay, just a minute. Pradeep, sir, there was one question in the here. Uh, it is from Sushan. Uh, is this uh, the same process has enhanced the rainfall? Enhanced rainfall, is it? A... No. Enhanced rainfall, again, see, this, yeah. is, this is a basic... Uh, sorry for the uh, type differences. Mohan, Mohan. So I'm grateful. Oh, Mohan, yeah. please, please wait. He is yeah, this is... Uh, see, what okay, I have please. described here is only the basic, uh, this one, enhanced rainfall. It, this will not be able to explain the enhanced rainfalls which you are seeing in terms of uh, the what you call as uh, these extreme rainfalls which you are seeing. No, this will not be able to explain that. This is just the basic process which I have, basic idea as to have given of to how a rain formation process can happen. Now, when you're looking at an enhanced rainfall, then there are so many other processes which you'll have to consider actually while you're doing the model, actual modeling, when you're running the model. So this is a, just a simple, very simple, very basic, which I have tried to explain, like how a, from the CCN in activation to a rain, how in a simple way it can be achieved. When you're actually going for modeling, the process is actually too complicated. I hope Sushan convinced with this uh, answer. Uh, Mohan, please proceed. Mohan. Yes, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I would like to take a moment to express my heartfelt appreciation for successful completion of today's international lecture series on cloud physics, uh, mainly microphysics of cloud. That is the part two of this series. It is my honor and privilege to extend my sincere thanks to each and every one of you who made the, uh, this event a resounding success. I'm grateful for the immense knowledge and expertise that our esteemed speaker, uh, Professor Dr. P. Pradeep Kumar at, uh, from uh, Shabitri Bhai Phule Pune University, SPPU, India, shared with us today. Your captivating presentation has left a lasting impression on our minds and your in-depth understanding of the subject matter has provided us with a new and enlightening perspective on the complex process of plot formation. I would also like to acknowledge the tireless dedication and hard work of our distinguished coordination committee members, including Professor A.V.M. Ojitiagi, President of SAMA, Professor Dr. Someshadda, Secretary of SAMA, Dr. T.V. Lakshmi Kumar, SRMIST, our session moderator, Dr. Rohini Bhawar from SPPU India, Dr. Shahagata Paira, BIT Mistra, India. 
Your commitment and ensuring the success of this event has been unwavering and your leadership and guidance have been instrumental in its resounding success. To our participants, your enthusiastic participation and engagement have greatly contributed to the success of this program. Your presence uh, here today is testament of, to your commitment to learning and exploring new horizons. And I commend you for your eagerness to delve into fascinating work of cloud physics. As we conclude this event, let us take a moment to reflect on the knowledge and insight that we have gained. And let us continue to work together towards achieving our goals in the future. Once again, Thank you to each and every one of you for uh, your unwavering support and participation in this event. We look forward to your continued engagement in our future endeavors. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mohan. Uh, with this, we have come to the end of the, today's lecture. Uh, dear participants, there is an instruction or announcement for you. Uh, so next Saturday, uh, we will not have a lecture. It is postponed to, it is scheduled on uh, Monday. That is on 15th, you will have lecture. Uh, sorry, it is on 17th. Sorry, it will, the lecture will be on 17th Monday. The lecture will be on uh, precipitation mechanisms. So it is not going to be held on uh, uh, 15th. So instead of 15th, we are scheduling this talk on 17th. So kindly note this. However, we will send this, uh, intimate this one to, uh, to email also. Uh, so kindly attend the lecture on precipitation mechanisms on 17th April 2023, same time. So thank you very much and thank you for attending this lecture. So I take this opportunity to thank uh, Professor Padip Kumar sir and Ajit Tyagi sir, Rosni Bauer, Mohan and other panelists of today's talk for their valuable time. So thank you sir, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.